Hey, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of the Tree of Life Church podcast. It's our prayer that these messages help connect you to the life, love, and power of Jesus. Are you ready for the word? All right. Hey, let's, let's turn our Bibles to De- Deuteronomy. We're still in our series. We'll finish it up next week. <clears throat> I just want to say this uh, and praise and worship as I was uh, there on the front row and we sang that song. I love that song, Reckless Love. Uh, you know, I love rec- the song Reckless Love because God's reckless love is unconditional love. Well, how do you know that? Uh, because we don't love that way. <laughs> because we won't take risks. We won't chase people down. We won't love people unless they love us. Come on, somebody. That's why God's love is reckless love to me. is unconditional love. It doesn't matter. It's worth the risk. He does it because it's who he is. Amen? And then as I was singing through that song um, about his overwhelming love, I just rose up in my spirit. Maybe this is for me. Maybe this is for somebody in here. That God's love overwhelms what's overwhelming you. Whatever it is that you're facing, experiencing, that seems to be overwhelming you. And we're talking about being overwhelmed in our mind this morning. God's love is big enough to overwhelm what overwhelms you. And so I just want to encourage you in that as we get started today. We are in, uh, I, don't, I guess this would be part four of our series. We really started it uh, January 1. So if you haven't been with us all these installments or, or been able to watch and welcome online, uh, you can always go back to the archives and listen to them. And I would encourage you to do that if you hadn't been a part of them or even if something really stood out in you. Like last week, we talked about unforgiveness. And there's some great things there in the scripture that Jesus shows us, uh, talks to us about unforgiveness that, that really work. You know the word works, right? <laughs> hey, there's a thought. The Bible works. And, and so when you apply them to your life, they, they work. They do. And you, you won't know it until you try it. And so uh, we all deal with unforgiveness. And that is one of the things I believe keeps us uh, from breaking free. It keeps pulling us back. Those moments, right? Those temporary moments of freedom. And then all of a sudden something pops in your mind or on your feed or somebody says something and it just triggers something in you and pulls you back. And so uh, last week we looked at the word to see how we could find some freedom uh, to break free from those uh, things that keep pulling us back. And here's our scripture. We're going to, uh, I'll talk to you about what we're actually, we're going to talk about in a minute, but let's look at Deuteronomy 2. Here's what it says in verse 1. You can hopefully quote this by now. Then we turned and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, coming out of captivity, just as the Lord had told me, and we circled Mount Seir for many days. And the Lord spoke to me saying, you have circled this mountain long enough, turn northward. I believe that's our verse for the year. I, I believe that's what God's saying to Tree of Life and therefore everyone that calls this place home or wants to be connected, associated with this place. It's time to not circle what we've been circling uh, for however long, maybe this last year, year after year after year. It's time to break free from some things in our life and turn north to what God has for us. So where those momentary victories or moments of peace and celebration become our new normal, we live there. We're not just visiting, right? We're not just visiting this momentary peace in my heart and my life, my mind. I'm not just visiting this momentary peace in my relationship. I'm I'm living there now. It's becoming a new normal for my life as I apply the word of God. But there's sometimes something inside of us, and we talked about this, I don't want to review a whole lot, but that, that, that pulls us back. And we use the analogy of a, like a gravitational pull. Something is spinning on the inside in your core, and it will pull you back if you don't know how to break free from that. Or, as we talked about, if you don't know how to eject whatever that is out of your life, it gives you the power to break free and walk in freedom. And so this is a base scripture a passage really for our series. But I wanted to, I felt in my heart I needed to share this one. We're probably all familiar or if you've been attending church for a while, John 10, 10, let me read it for you, just as a reminder, the thief does not come except, he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So you don't have to have, you don't need to have anything to do with them. Come on, somebody, okay. We're gonna get, sing again, I don't know. Coffee for everybody, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that fasting's really got you down. No, I'm just kidding. It's like, this is what he does, so don't entertain conversation with them. Goes on to say this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on. Okay, there you go. I'm going to amen myself. Hey, it works better if, we'll get out of here a lot quicker if you amen with me. Otherwise, I'm going to keep you here all morning, all right? That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. <laughs> but Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly or to the full. There is two choices, two workings out there. One is set to seal, kill, and destroy. The other is for you to have life, life more abundantly. So if you're not experiencing abundant life, you need to find out what it is pulling you back. Because it's not God. It's not God. God says, I want you to have not just life, but life more abundantly or to the full. And God's not asking you just to get by. Come on. He's not asking you just to cope. 
He's not just trying to get to make it. He wants you to have freedom, find freedom and experience what he has for you. And, and, and so I think it's important for us to be reminded of that, especially today. And, and the area I want to talk about today, I want to look at this scripture. I believe there's another area that would tend, I know it does for me, to, to pull me back again, uh, get, keep me from breaking free. I'll have those moments of freedom or peace and experience that, but something pulls me back sometimes. And that is just being overwhelmed in your mind. It might be anxiety, it might be stress, it might be fear, it might be worry, it might be panic, and eventually it will lead to depression. And I know, honestly, I know today, and I didn't want to come and bring a whole lot of statistics. I wanted this to be uplifting, <laughs> and uh, oh, message on depression, uplifting, okay. <laughs> and uh, hey, welcome to Tree of Life. And uh, so, <laughs> but well, we'll look at some things in the scripture that will help us find some freedom, because really this, whether we're willing to admit it or not, is overwhelming. And all we have to do is look back at the last few years. The isolation has created, if it wasn't bad already, isolation has created this uh, in us of uh, anxiety and fear and, 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 and depression at times in, in all areas of life, all ages of life. And it's amazing to me how the statistics have gone incredibly up on people dealing with things like suicide or mental health issues or depression, um, how young they can be to how old they can be. And we're seeing things we've never seen before. And I believe it's the enemy working overtime to overwhelm our mind and our emotions. And I believe that's one of the things, if we don't learn how to deal with it in a healthy way, that we'll have momentary times of freedom, but something will keep pulling us back again. But I believe that the prescription for everything is found in the Word of God. Amen? And I believe there's other things we can add to that, but I believe that we need to always start with the Word of God. So we're going to talk about that this morning, and we're going to look at um, just uh, a man who might be considered maybe the greatest prophet in the Scripture in the Old Testament, uh, arguably uh, the prophet Elijah. And I say that because of all the things that you read in the great passages of Scripture, the great things he did for God. Uh, but in the New Testament, there's a moment where Jesus goes up on the top of the mountains called Mount Transfiguration. It's not its regular name, that's what it became called, because Jesus took Peter, James, and John with them, and there was a moment that he was transfigured in the fullness of his glory, and right there with them appeared on the top of that mountain, appeared Moses and Elijah. So I would say, heaven would say, that Elijah was one of the greatest prophets that ever lived on the planet, right? And so I think that's a pretty good indicator. And so when we look at his life, we can find some great principles for you and I to find freedom from being overwhelmed mentally, uh, mental health or emotions or depression or panic, worry, anxiety. And it begins by looking at Elijah. And Elijah was a, a, a mighty man of God and saw amazing miracles, and yet he found himself at a dark place. Isn't that interesting? One of the greatest prophets ever known, according to Scripture, and even as we saw just described in the Mount of Transfiguration, according to heaven had dealt with depression and darkness in his life. In fact, after two of his greatest victories, he found himself at a place where the enemy attacked his soul. And just a little background, don't turn there, but in 1 Kings 18, we see two amazing passages of Scripture where the first one is where uh, there's been a drought for three and a half years, and so uh, Elijah confronts King Ahab of Israel. They have gone to worshiping idols, and so there's just a remnant of people of God worshiping God left. And so Elijah says, God wants to meet and have basically have a battle with your prophets, his prophet, your prophets. We're going to uh, create a sacrifice. We're going to call fire down from heaven. And whosoever God sends fire to consume the offering or sacrifice, then that will be the God. And so King Ahab agreed in the 450 prophets of Baal, 400 other prophets, but they were there preparing their sacrifice. And they built an altar and they gathered wood and they cut a, a bowl in half. They put it on the altar, and they spent all day calling for Baal, the god Baal, to send the fire. And of course, nothing happened. And, and they got louder, and they danced more, and they cut themselves and bled more. And, and I love Elijah because he was just mocking him. Maybe he's asleep. <laughs> Maybe he's like looking at somebody else right now. I don't know. Help us away. And uh, so nothing happens, of course, in Elijah's turn, right? It's my God's turn. So he says, he builds an altar with stone. He puts, uh, and cuts a bull in half, puts it on there. Then he digs a trench all the way around it. Now they're in a three and a half year drought. He has the trench filled with water and he douses three times with these big kettles of water and the sacrifice. He prays, asks God to show himself. Fire from heaven falls, consumes everything. It said it consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the wood. It consumed the stones. It consumed every bit of water in the trench. Great victory. And then Elijah goes up to the uh, mountaintop and he prays for rain because now there'd been a drought for three and a half years. And so, um, so he sees uh, a cloud off in the distance after several times sending a servant. He sends his servant down to King Ahab, says, you need to get in your chariot and you go to the city because it is 
fixing to downpour. And so the rain came like a monsoon. And the Bible says that Elijah outran the king's chariot. So those two things were back to back in chapter 18. You can read them for yourself. And then just a few verses later, he gets a text message from Queen Jezebel. (laughs) And he says, I'm going to do to you what you did to my, my prophets. And all of a sudden, he ran in fear for his life. I don't know if you can relate to that. I don't know how you go from that high to that low. And I've certainly been in places like that myself at times, but yet you need to know that God's greatest prophet experienced the same thing. That's comforting to me because then we know in that, we know by looking at his life, how he came out of that, we can find truth for you and I. In fact, in 1 Kings 19, 2 through 4, here it goes. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Big mistake. Look at that in a minute. While he himself, by himself, went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, kind of a low-hanging tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And I don't know, and I, I, I don't want to ask you that question today. Maybe you've prayed that prayer, had those thoughts. Maybe you've been so overwhelmed with emotion and fear and anxiety that you've gotten to that dark place. Elijah did. And so we're going to look at his life and see what was it that Elijah enabled Elijah to come out of this moment because all of a sudden he has these amazing victories. And now all of a sudden he finds himself praying for God to take his life. So let's pick up the story here now in 1 Kings 19 verse 5. We'll continue on. Starting in verse five. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some baked bread, bread, big bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. Can I just say, can I have that angel? Okay. Uh, so he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. And let me also throw in here, strengthened by that food and sleep, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And Horeb, the mountain of God, understand is Mount Sinai. And why that's significant? Because in the Old Testament, God would interact with his people externally. So there was a, this was known to be the presence of God would be on the top of this mountain. But we know in the New Testament, and when we give our heart and life to Jesus, now we, we, we deal with God or he lives with us internally, amen? He's no longer an external God, he's an internal God for everyone who calls Jesus Savior and Lord, amen? Aren't you glad for that? So he's an internal God now. So notice though, when the angel visited Elijah during his time of need, he didn't tend to his spiritual needs first. What did he do? He tended to his physical needs. Do you get that? Get up and eat. Sleep, get up and eat, sleep. You're gonna need your strength from the food and your sleep for the journey ahead. And I wanna say to you, I'm gonna give you five steps to break free from those moments in your life, that depression perhaps, those dark moments that keep pulling you back. And I wanna say the first one is step into physical recovery. And that's important for you and I because you and I put physical recovery the last part. We have to have some kind of breakthrough spiritually to receive. So we'll come to moments and events and meetings, believing God for a spiritual breakthrough. The problem with that is if you're not physically able, it will pull you right back to where you are. In fact, let me say it this way. Sometimes God's solution doesn't have a chance to work in our body because we can't manage it physically. We can't. And so what the angel is saying, you need to rest and you need to eat. Let me say it this way. You need to eat right. Quit not eating. And you need to rest. And I don't care if you're tossing and turn all night, you need to find some time to lay down and take a break. Because you need to physically be able to receive the solution that God has for you. Isn't that true? Sometimes we're, in our natural, sometimes we're we're so sick the doctor can't treat one thing, he has to treat something else to get us strong enough where we can be treated. Come on, because our bodies will reject the solution or the answer at times. And so I believe what the angel is saying here, what God is saying here is, listen, you want to get over the things that we wrestle with and deal with, number one, is make sure you're taking care of you. It's the only thing that you can control. The only thing you can control is your time. You're not going to schedule something now. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to just, all of a sudden I'm going to bury myself in my work so I don't have to deal with that. No, it's going to make things worse. 
I just can't eat. No, you need to eat. You need to find times. You need to find ways. You need to eat good. You need to sleep good. You need to rest good. You need to say no to some things. You need to start. It starts with your physical recovery. That's the starting point. It begins with controlling what you can control. And we need to understand that in order for us to be able to walk out the solution that God has, it's going to require you and I to do what we can do and take care of yourself physically. Um, you can come in here a sermon and get inspired and motivated, but unless you can manage that physically, it's not going to affect you spiritually long term. Maybe someone prayed over you. Maybe someone gave you a scripture. Maybe you had a word from a friend, counseling. Maybe it was time in praise and worship, and those are great things. And, but if you're not healthy enough with your body to receive it, your body will reject it. So isn't it interesting that the angel takes him on a journey of physical health before spiritual health? I think that's a big deal for you and I. We got to flip. We think the spiritual thing's going to impact us positively physically. But God says, you do what you can do, and I'll do what I can do. So before we do anything else, the angel says, go take a nap, get up, get something to eat, take a nap, get up, something to eat. Can I just, I, I want him around me every day. <laughs> now, if he's around you during the fasting and says, get up and eat, that's the fallen angel. That's not, <laughs> you keep fasting, all right, all right. <laughs> you know, um, a number of us haven't gotten healthy enough to go on a journey. You're going to have strength for the journey, right? Because it's a journey. You didn't get in it overnight. It's a journey to get out of it. But you got to keep your strength so you can get out of it. And we have to get our lives back in order to do that. And we have to take control of what we can control, and that is our time. Ecclesiastes 4, 6 says this, uh, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Better is one handful with tranquility than two with toil and chasing after the wind. Now, we don't believe that because what we're taught, we talked last week, we need to unlearn some stuff, but we're taught by the world, better is two handfuls than one handful. Come on. I mean, we may not want to admit it, but that's what, you know, two cars are better than one car in my family. I got four people, so four cars, right? I mean, it's like, I got to get that other thing, two things. But, but the scripture says, just maybe one and some peace is okay. I'll take care of you. But we're chasing after more, we're chasing after more, we're chasing after more. And a lot of us are living life to full limit. We're tired, we're exhausted. We weren't designed for nonstop activity. You realize God designed you to have Sabbath. God designed you to have fellowship with him. We're not designed for nonstop activity, chasing after the wind. We need to slow our lives down. Moses said this in, 90, in Psalm 90, 12. I didn't put it in your notes, but Psalm 90, verse 12. He said, teach us, Lord, to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Boy, would that be revelation. There's a lot of things we need to say no to. And let me say this, Sabbath is not a service. This is the Sabbath. You need to go home and then Sabbath. You need to go home and find time to rest. Uh, let me say it this way. You need to go home and take a nap and then get up and get something to eat and then go back to sleep and get up and get something to eat again. It's a biblical principle. I just helped you right there. First Kings, worth the price of admission today. First Kings 19, verse 9. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the Lord, word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous. I've done everything I can do for you, God. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, not me. They torn down your altars, not me. They put your prophets to death with a sword. Okay, maybe I had a hand in that. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for he is about to pass by. We'll, we'll stop for just one second there. We'll get back to that in a minute. Go out and stand in the presence of the Lord. Go out and stand in the presence of the Lord. You know, really, the key to everything in our life is the presence of the Lord. Because you know where Elijah found himself, right? Yeah, after the greatest victory, and then he gets, you know, a text message, someone posts something on his, you know, Instagram board or whatever, and all of a sudden, it just rocked his world, and now he's hiding out in a cave. Can I, can I just say, the cave for you and I is just that place of darkness. But it feels like that. It feels like you can be there. And so... First thing God says to him after the angel had been ministering to him about being, getting himself physically better was now we need to start with the presence of the Lord. That's a prescription for everything in life, right? We start with the presence of the Lord. 
Go and stand in the presence of the Lord. Verse 12, let's go there. Then a great powerful wind tore through the mountains. And we're going we're gonna to see where the, where the Lord is in all this. A great powerful wind tore through the mountains or tore them apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. See, if you don't spend time in the presence of the Lord, you're not going to be able to hear his gentle voice. Because we're looking for the big and we're looking for the dynamic. I need breakthrough. I need something big to happen. I need something dynamic to happen to get me out of this. And God says, first of all, take control of what you can control yourself physically. Eat better. Find some time to rest. And then enter into my presence. And when you're in my presence, it's not going to be the big dynamic thing. It's not going to be the big event, the big moment, the big miracle we're all looking for. It's going to be that intimate moment with him that precious, sweet voice of the Lord that we tend to overlook because we think it has to be the dynamic, it has to be the spectacular, the miraculous. And I want to encourage you today that the greatest prescription for anything you face is the presence of God. And here's what the presence of God looked like. We just saw a gentle whisper, a gentle whisper. So step two, you need to step into a God encounter. Step one was physical recovery, eat right, Watch your time, your activity. Find some time to rest. Next thing, you need to get into the presence of the Lord or you need a God encounter. And let me let you in on a little secret. God is in these moments where it's quiet. See, we're looking for the big moments, the supernatural, the dynamic, the spectacular, but God's looking for the intimate moments with you. Psalms 46.10 says this. He says, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations and I'll be exalted in the earth, but be still and know I am God. That's where you know he's God in the stillness, in those moments. And the best way to do this is through the intimacy of worship. I believe the same part of you that you worry from is the same part of you that you worship from because I believe it comes from your soul. I believe it's intimate. I believe it's everything that you can give to God. I believe it's everything you can give to your problem. I think sometimes we take our worry and put it on our problem and it just feeds that problem in our soul where we can take worry, turn it into worship and give our soul to God in worship and it feeds God in our life, not the problem in our life. So worship is the key, those intimate moments you find in worship. It turns your emotions towards God instead of your problem because you can't worry and worship at the same time. It's impossible, try it. Those times when you feel overwhelmed mentally and overwhelmed emotionally, I believe the secret is worship. Let me say this. You need to get a playlist. But I got one. How's your work? You got a, we got a playlist for, if I worked out, I'd have a playlist workout. <laughs> I'd have a workout. And it would be, it would have, it would start with the eye of the tiger, right? Survivor, that'd be it, right? That'd be, that'd be our first one. How about a road trip playlist? Playlist every time I'm on the road, right? Life is a highway, come on. Do you have a bedtime playlist? My wife has a bedtime playlist, and half of it's in Spanish, which I love, and we just go to sleep to that every night. But I love those moments of just like smooth jazz, something that, you know, we have, we have those playlists, right? How about a warfare prayer playlist, right? Come on, where you can just really get after the devil, so you get, this is how we fight our battles. You get run, devil, run, right? We got all those songs out there. How about a worship one? You don't even have to sing to it. You have those moments that you get overwhelmed and like all the other activities in our life that we have playlists associated with, do you have a worship playlist that, that you just feed on that and it feeds your soul and then feeds your spirit, man? I, I think we need to be more intentional with those times. We need a worship one that calms us. We don't have to sing to it. I'm not talking, I'm just sit under it. You know when Saul, King Saul was the first king of Israel when he was tormented with the evil spirit or overwhelmed emotionally and overwhelmed spiritually, he would bring David in, shepherd boy David in with his harp and he would just play. We need a worship playlist. So you can feel the peace and presence of God in those moments because God inhabits the praises of his people. In fact, John 4 says God is looking for seeking after worshipers. He's looking for worshipers. So if you can't find God, worship and God will find you. If you can't find him because you're overwhelmed, worship and God will find you. That's why Friday night, night of worship is so important. God's gonna find us. He's going to meet us in that moment. And we're going to create that moment, help create that moment for you. But if you come, you can come and sing and leave and not have anything. But if you'll come and intimately worship your heavenly father 
and then listen for his voice, you'll hear him speaking to you. And that's why we have Saturday prayer and then our Sunday service. Look at Psalm 73, 16 through 17. This is written by Asaph, who was the worship leader at the time, if you will. And he had just been complaining, scriptures before this, just been complaining. And then it gets to verse 16. He says, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. And then I understood, and then I understood their final destiny. It wasn't until I complain, 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 I don't understand it, until I entered the sanctuary of God. Written by Asaph, Asaph was the worship leader of that day. It was in that moment when I got in the presence of God, then it all became clear. 1 Kings 19, 13 through 14, let's pick our story back up. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face. And I believe that's very important. He hid his face. And a face is what identifies us. We identify you by your face. I may not know. I see the back of your head. I may not know. When I see your face, I know who you are. And that's important because I believe what he was doing, he was feeling this sense of ins- insignificance or insecurity. So he hid his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah, again? And he repeats what he just repeated. I've been very zealous for you. I'm the only one. I've worked every, uh, so hard. I've given you everything. The Israelites rejected you and put your prophets to death with a sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. Here's a person who's lost his confidence. You know when he lost his confidence? When Queen Jezebel posted it on his social media. <laughs> that's, that's when he lost his confidence. And you know what? He forgot who he was. So he hid his face from God. Instead of remembering he's a child of God. And so he was hiding his identity. And all of a sudden, it polluted his, all the, when he got that text or he got that message rather in verse one, it polluted his soul and his spirit. And so many of us are too into what others say about us, what people do to us, what happens to us. And we buy into this world's narrative about us that's not true. That's why we need to step into our, number three, our true identity. We need to step into our true identity, who we are in Christ, who he's called us to be. You need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know what God says about you. Step into what God says about you. That's why church is so important because all we hear in this world is toxic and lies. But when you come in here, I'm gonna promise you this, whether it's me or somebody else in this pulpit, when you come in here, you're gonna hear you are loved, you are forgiven, you are redeemed, you are healed, you are delivered, you are valuable, you have a purpose, you make a difference, you're a child of God. You need to know, no one can make you inferior, feel inferior without your consent. You're a child of God. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. You're an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror. You're going to hear that when you come into place. Listen, one time a week is not enough, to be honest. Because we're hearing it six days the rest of the week different. The world's narrative for our life. And you have to decide to believe what God says about you, not what man says about you. 1 Kings 19, 15 through 18. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go back to to the desert of Damascus. Now, hold on for a second right there. The way he came, remember the story said the way he got where he was was through Beersheba. The word Beersheba means the place of oath. It's the place that Elijah took his oath to follow God. I'm giving my life to you. My life is not my own, it's yours. Whatever you have for me, God, I will do. And then all of a sudden, he finds himself at this place where he's lost his confidence. He's forgot not only who he was, but why he was. He, He forgot his purpose. And God said to him, you forgot your purpose. So go back to the place you made your oath and recommit, if you will. And do what you're supposed to do. Do what you were doing before. Well, what's that? Anointing people. Let's go back to that right here and finish out that scripture. And when you get there, anoint Haziel over Aram because that's what you do. Also anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah and to succeed you as prophet. And Jehu, don't worry, Jehu will put to death anyone who escaped the sword of Haziel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I have 7,000, oh, oh, just so you know, I have 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. You're not the only one. But go back and do what I've called you to do. You forgot your purpose. Don't forget your purpose, church. 
Don't forget your purpose. So number four is step into a new assignment today. Step into a new purpose today. See, secular psychologists will tell you there's nothing more powerful than a project. That's what the world will say. Well, that's biblical. If you wake up every day just to eat, work, sleep, you'll end up in this dark place. But if you know what your life means and how it matters and that it makes a difference for eternity, that's a whole different thing. And I just to be honest with you this morning, I mean, I wrestle with all this stuff too. It's been, it's been a tough couple of weeks. Just in the last couple of weeks, I've buried two friends. I, I've had to do the service for it. That's hard. I've had opportunities to be offended, and I've been offended by people close to me. And I've had to wrestle with that myself. I wasn't feeling so good last week. If you remember, I struggling with something physically. My body wouldn't feel like my allergies were kicking off, and I discovered that I was allergic to fasting. And... Uh, <laughs> So I took two, I, I, took two, I took two donuts and uh, <laughs> snapped right out of it. But I'll tell you, I, wasn't fe- I wasn't feeling so good on top of everything else. It kind of seemed how it works that way. <laughs> and then I've seen the services full of people. When I stand up here and see full rooms, I see hands go up. In fact, since January 1, we've seen 93 people give their life to Jesus. Twenty-seven of those kids. And I received this week a report from India, from our friends in India. And the report said that they've opened 86 villages to the gospel, planted 48 churches, and seen over 1,500 people come to Christ in a country where it's illegal. And I saw my wife stand up here last week talk about 806 bags of food, and I've had the opportunity to talk to her about it. We had a video two weeks ago in the last week, and I remember 538 pairs of shoes that we all, pick, we all help provide, and then I remember that picture of Lupita. And that's the best medicine of all. To be a part of something greater than yourself is the best medicine of all. I didn't need to take medicine. I, need, I didn't need a shot in the arm. I, I got a shot in my heart. And it was that life matters, our lives matter. That we can make a difference. That's why we have services. That's why we take offerings. That's why we fast and pray. That's why we preach. That's why we worship. That's why we do what we do. The best medicine is called purpose. And we're here to do something with our lives. And that's why it's so important to serve. And you may not know exactly what your purpose is, but let me just say simply this, find a need and meet it. That's why you need to serve. That's why you can come here and, and we're, we're making it happen without you, but we'd be better with you, but you'd be better serving. Fill a purpose in your life. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Get your purpose, find your purpose, find your assignment. Here's a quote by Viktor Frankl. People have enough to live by but nothing to live for. They have the means, but no meaning. In a few weeks, February 5th and February 12th, I'm gonna do what I do every February, my go messages. And it's simply this, go G stands for generosity. We're gonna look at your generosity and what it enabled us to do through your serving, through your prayers and through your giving in 2022. That's gonna be some good medicine. Oh, opportunity. Here's what we can do this year. Together, that's gonna be some good medicine finding our purpose. I hope all of you come back because we all need it. We all need to be reminded that we're here to be a part of something greater than ourselves and our lives matter. Every single one of us matters. So we go back the way we came to where we first made the commitment and gave our life to Jesus and said, whatever you want me to do, God, I surrender all to you and I'll do what you want me to do. We go back to that place for our new assignment. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweigh them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 
I have something greater in my life than my problems. We all have problems, but the problem isn't our problem. The problem is we don't have something bigger than our problem. So let's make some adjustments physically. Let's find some times of rest, eat better. Let's learn how to encounter God, how to get in his presence and hear his still small voice. Let's believe what God has to say about us. Find our identity in him. And let's find our purpose and go live it out. First Kings 19, 19, let's finish out our story. So Elijah went from here and there, or went from there rather, and found Elisha. Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Now listen to this. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. You know what he did? He put his cloak around a friend. I'm not doing this alone any longer. I'm not going to be by myself. He threw his cloak around a friend. So the fifth step coming out of that darkness, when you're overwhelmed with emotion, you're overwhelmed with life, and you find yourself in that dark place, step into a relational strength moment. Step into a relationship. You weren't designed to go through this by yourself. Remember, I made comment earlier when he left his servant and went on by himself. Big mistake. Big mistake. You're not designed to, be, to do this life by yourself. That's why you need a church. That's why you need a place to belong. That's why you need a family, a church family, a community. That's why you need a group, people to build. That's why you need to serve, to get to know people and build relationships. You weren't designed to walk this out alone. You need a friend. You are not alone today. I want you to know that. And we can all walk this out together. We're stronger together. We need each other. And we're going to stay strong and healthy. And we're going to start the year out that way, getting things in order, getting free from the things that keep pulling us back. And we're going to do it together because you're not alone. Because if you went up to start, share your story with someone in this room, they'd look at you and say, oh, you too? You too? Oh, yeah, you're in the right place. So I want to encourage you as I close. We're going to take some naps. <laughs> Not together. <laughs> we're going to eat. We're going to nap. We're going to get up and eat. We're going to meet with God here and in our homes, groups by ourselves. We're going to meet with God. We're going to get a right identity. We're going to believe what God says about us. And maybe we need to block out all the other voices. We're going to live our lives on purpose because we're here for something greater than our individual selves. And we're going to do it with a group of friends. A church family. Amen, everybody? Amen. And we're going to find freedom and we're going to break out of that pole in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us this week. We pray that this message encouraged and inspired you. If you want to find out how you can be a part of Tree of Life, just go to our website, treeoflifechurch.org. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and share it with a friend.